Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade, and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Show. Today, I'm so excited to have Betty Weibull on the show with us. And hi, Betty. Welcome to the show. Oh, my gosh. I appreciate this opportunity so much. Oh, I, it's my pleasure. It's, um, like I said, just learning and watching you doing all that you're doing and watching your podcast was just phenomenal. Thank you so much for inviting me. Of course. I'm so happy to support fellow horse book authors, and I'm, I'm glad we're doing this today. So I'm going to read your bio, your brief bio for folks so they know a little bit about you before we get into the fun part, which is the questions. Betty Weibull is a lifelong equestrian whose career spans more than 30 years as a journalist and public relations professional. Her first nonfiction book, The Cleveland Grand Prix, an American show jumping first, was published in 2014. And today we're going to talk about her newest book, Little Victories, A True Story of the Healing Power of Horses. So Betty, thank you for coming to the show. And I think the best way sometimes to start these off is just to learn a little bit more about you and your involvement with horses. So I'd love to hear how you fell in love with horses. Uh, well, like you and so many people who are listening, horses were part of my childhood growing up. I always had a fascination and was lucky enough to get involved in riding lessons So in my early years and later went on to do 4-H and get involved that way. My parents... Um, you know, we, we saved and saved and didn't have the money for a horse. And my brothers helped with a penny jar. And mm -hmm. I took riding lessons and uh, clean stalls in trade for lessons early on. And went on to finally get my first horse and just enjoyed the sport so much and competed as a junior. Now, my background is in the hunter-jumper world. Mm -hmm. and But I think I've done everything from riding side saddle and fox hunting to Western. And I love trying it all and learning new things. So it's been great for me. Um, I loved horses so much as a kid that I chose to go to college with an equestrian program and oh, cool. went and I'm here in the Midwest in Ohio. And the one I knew at the time was Lake Erie college. And I double majored in equestrian science and communications because in addition to writing, the only other talent I had in life was writing and I love to write. <laughs> so those are my early years of taking lessons in writing. Well, way to embrace that because I, I, you know, I think we are born with it, this urge to write and this urge to be with horses. I, I really think that it just kind of all the authors that I've been interviewing on the, on the spotlight keep saying, you know, it's like, these are the two passions that I've, I've had ever since I can remember. And, and it's really cool to hear that, that you're having the same experience. And I love that you tried all sorts of different disciplines when it came to horses. I think 4-H is a great way to do that and explore all sorts of different ways of being with horses. I grew up in the 4-H program too. I'm, I'm actually from Michigan and my husband ah. is from Ohio. So we've got the Midwest roots in common. Good people. <laughs> do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and let me ask you, so do you currently own, own a horse? I'd love to, to hear about, about that too. Oh, sure. I do. My barn, um, I fortunate to live in a rural area and I have my own barn and I start every day uh, cleaning stalls. It puts your life in perspective when you start by shoveling manure <laughs> and then it goes from there. So my barn has my retired show hunter, the, uh, Luminaire, and he's 21 and my daughter competed uh, with him as well in the children's and a young professional. So he's had an illustrious career and enjoying himself now and just does light hacks. And he's joined by two other other uh, oldsters. Snickers is a retired therapeutic riding pony who's mm. 34. And my 
youngest uh, addition is 28, uh, Moose. He's a 300 pound mini horse and they <laughs> are a joy to take care of and uh, keep me fit doing Perfect. my barn work. That's great. And oh my goodness, do our horses ever keep us fit? I think, you know, it's so great. It's like better than having a gym membership. You're out in nature, you're with the horses and, you know, people sometimes look at me and they're like, you enjoy scooping poo? And I was like, yes, actually it's my meditation. It's my exercise. It doesn't smell bad. You know, it just smells like grass. <laughs> so, Nothing I, wrong with good hard work. Yeah. I loved your analogy for starting off the day. And, you know, I have, I really enjoyed galloping around your website and learning more about you as we, as I prepared the questions for this interview. And one thing that was really interesting to me is in, in awesome is that you have always been a supporter and admirer, admirer of the work of Fieldstone Farm Therapeutic Riding Center, as well as PATH International. You know, tell us, and you're really interested and involved in therapeutic riding. So can you tell us a little bit about um, the value of therapeutic writing programs and how you became involved with therapeutic writing. I, I think that's, it's so, such an amazing thing to be involved in and share with others. Great question. I, you know, when I was in college, among my equestrian courses I took was one in teaching writing. Uh, at the time, it was called teaching writing for the handicapped. And mm -hmm. certain terminologies have changed uh, since way back when in my day. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to sound like a senior here, but uh, around since dirt, Carly, what can I say? <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so I got a, a good acclimation early on in college and learning about therapeutic riding programs. And later, one of the individuals who was in my class went on to start his own therapeutic riding program. And that's the one that um, in the 80s uh, started in somebody's backyard and grew into, over the years, Fieldstone Farm Therapeutic Riding Center. And Fieldstone is one of um, gosh, over 900 PATH international certified centers in the world. And that's the Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship. And in the early days when they were renting space, they were um, just really grassroots ground up. I was aware of what they were doing. And I started helping by using my skills in publicity and promotion, helping them get some attention when they decided to build their own facility. So I kind of followed it along and stayed involved. Later, I joined their board of directors and um, have since uh, continued to support them and help them. Um, Ohio is an incredible state in that there's about 40 um, therapeutic riding centers. And while well, Fieldstone tends to be one of the larger, bigger budgeted and innovative ones in the country, um, I just want to point out it represents so many other centers everywhere that are doing great work. And uh, through my work with Fieldstone, I've learned about other riding centers and the rich heritage of uh, therapeutic riding in this country. It's, it's rather new compared to Europe, but uh, we're there's so many great things that are happening and I'm really proud to be a part of it and just see the little things that happen in a riding lesson when an adult or a child connects with the horse. When you see someone walk in, well, wheel in for a lesson or come in on their crutches or braces and, you know, gradually get to the mounting block and get into the saddle, which is a long process for some of the students. And then it's almost like they're set free once they're on a horse. And it will just warm your heart. If you've never been to a therapeutic riding center, I encourage your listeners, go on the PATH International website and find a center near you and just check it out. It's, it's just fascinating to see that just impressive work that's being done and the connection between a horse and a human and how it really heals the soul. Mm -hmm. And, and I commend you for the work that you're doing and the, and the, uh, you know, sharing the stories and, and using the degrees that you've gotten in college to really pr promote this beautiful healing partnership between humans and horses and in the organizations that are, are making that possible, which leads us to your most recent book. Can you tell us a little bit about your book 
and and hold up the cover and tell us you know obviously you've been working with these organizations or these organizations for a long time you're a big fan yes. of therapeutic writing yeah tell us about your book and your book you know there are so many stories at Fieldstone Farm Therapeutic Writing Center and at every therapeutic writing center and so much great work being done. I felt my role was just to help share some of the stories. And the book, um, the cover is um, a combination of Fieldstone Farm Therapeutic Writing Center and one of the main subjects of the book is Debbie Gaddis. And I wrote the book you know, it took a number of years, but I, I wrote the book. Uh, it's nonfiction, obviously, and a, a true story. And at first, I started writing about Fieldstone Farm, and then I rewrote it, and I felt it needed to be more personal. Mm -hmm. So I took the approach of one individual's story, and that's Debbie Gaddis, because I'd heard of her story when she was a riding instructor, a young girl out of college teaching lessons when a roof collapsed on her one winter and she was paralyzed in a, a horrible accident. And I knew Debbie remotely and uh, saw her story and follow up. It made all the headlines in the newspapers and it's more than 25 years ago this happened, mm -hmm. but I was interested in the story. And then as I kept hearing things about Debbie and our paths crossed and seeing what she was accomplishing, that's when I became even more curious about the rest of the story beyond the initial accident. So Debbie went on to ride again, and that's where she discovered the Therapeutic Riding Center, Fieldstone Farm, as it was later known. And I detail through the book her story. She shared with me so many details that were hard for her because she's not a person who likes to open up. Mm -hmm. And she was so kind because she understood my purpose was to help people and non-horse people uh, too, and people who are of all ages, teens through adults, be able to understand the life of someone who becomes disabled, how they can come back. And Debbie came back, not to spoil the story, but there's a lot of detail on how she rehabbed, um, what she went through with the rescue workers digging her out. And then it goes on to her discovering the Therapeutic Riding Center and that wonderful world. She goes on to volunteer there, to work there. Mm -hmm. And then she becomes an advocate for others with disabilities by starting a carriage driving program that uh, the National Association had just gotten off the ground. And she started that locally. And that program has gone on to help so many um, individuals, especially veterans who maybe can't get into the saddle. So in writing this book, I started with Debbie's story. I crossed paths with the therapeutic riding story, and I included along the way different stories. So it's not one person. I tried to share different perspectives. Um, and that includes the story of one of the veterans and what he went through. Um, I interviewed and included the story of a parent and how she felt about her child um, discovering and what the impact was on their lives. Uh, there was a woman who donated her horse and I told from her perspective of donating a horse and the life of the horses at the Therapeutic Riding Center, as well as a longtime volunteer and what it was like to be a volunteer. So it was kind of like, I don't know if you like to do puzzles, Carly, but it's mm -hmm. kind of like a jigsaw puzzle where you have a lot of pieces and you find a way to put them all together. And that's what I tried to do with this book with the ultimate purpose of helping people just get a, a view of a different type of a world and an inspirational story. But maybe through this, they'll get a feel for um, what the work is. And maybe they'll know someone who could benefit or who might like to volunteer. And um, I think the stories um, will resonate, whether you know anything about horses or not, hopefully you'll be able to appreciate that. Oh, that, that is lovely. That sounds like such a wonderful book. And I'm so excited to dive in. Thank you so much for your generous gift. Uh, Betty sent the book to me and I can't wait to read it because it just recently came out, didn't it? It was, it was 
You are my first, you're my first podcast, Carly, and my first interview. So the book's only been out a week and you are right on it, girl. (laughs) So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And you are an equestrian author. So, you know, they're like your babies when, you know, especially in nonfiction. Well, it's a different animal. And when you put all that into it, you, it's hard to let go and release it finally. So Mm -hmm. um, I'm anxious to hear from people what they think of it, what they learn from it, and how it impacts it. I've heard, I sent the book to all the people who gave me time to be interviewed and who contributed photographs, and I'm hearing little bits and pieces back. And, um, you know, you always hold your breath and hope, you know, you got it right. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, I'm sure you got it right. And I am very excited to read it. I'm honored to have you on the show and to be one of your first interviews. That's so exciting. Thank you for being here. I wanted to um, talk a little bit more. There are some people who have this um, impression of therapeutic writing that it is um, maybe like new age or, you know, don't really understand it. And so I wanted to ask you, and maybe this is too in depth for this this particular conversation, but what what can someone expect if they're curious about therapeutic writing when they go to visit a center and maybe they decide they want to do a session? Like, is it is it personalized for for people based on what they're dealing with, or, or are a lot of the sessions similar? Like, what what can someone expect if they're going to go to a center and and, and want want more information about what it's like? Sure. I would recommend if anyone goes to um, obviously, you know, look at everything online first, line up a tour and get familiar and just see what they offer. Therapeutic writing centers today have evolved so much from the early days. And I'm so impressed with the work they do because they look at the community and the needs of the area and adapt to that. So there are some centers that focus on group lessons. Some may have private. Uh, I know Fieldstone offers summer camp programs for children. Um, Their programs have evolved to include um, everything from, like I said, the carriage driving program, which serves a lot of veterans, uh, but also they have programs that are unmounted. There are uh, and, and I want to go back a minute. So we're talking clients who are children and adults. They may be mental or physical disabilities or emotional support needs. So it's expanded over the years to serve many needs. I know there's programs that deal with the wounded warriors and Fieldstone has that, but there's also programs that are dealing with individuals who are victims of human trafficking or cancer survivors or or families of cancer patients. So I think that um, I can't give you a specific answer because it depends on the program in your area. And Fieldstone a few years ago added a um, high school of all things called Gateway and it's spelled G-A-I-T-W-A-Y. And Gateway School is for high school students who might not have gone through a traditional high school. They may they were at risk teens for possible behavior disorders. It could be um, someone on the spectrum. There's just a variety of um, behavioral issues that um, they are not able to survive in a traditional uh, high school. So they go to the Gateway School, which is attached to Fieldstone Farm, and it's a traditional high school environment with teachers and a principal, and some of their lessons are done in the barn. And um, so it's just so innovative and creative what's happening. And uh, I think I can't give you a set answer on Mm -hmm. what to expect because every program is so different. And, but I think that was the perfect explanation because I love how you expanded upon, you know, it, it covers a variety of wellness issues that people are, are, are trying to manage. So horses have this healing power in so many different uh, realms, right? So, so it's, it, and I think you really clarified that. I think that, that that's wonderful. Sure. Fieldstone is one of the largest in the country. So it's, a different example. There are small programs that are so incredibly valuable as well that may only deal with a dozen students at a time or less. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say they're equally as valuable in the services they provide, but you just have to, you know, depends what you're looking for. There's 
I'm sure a center near you that uh, that will offer some of the same services or pieces of the services that Fieldstone offers as a whole. Mm -hmm. And you know, every, and everybody needs their own perfect fit. You know, so so taking a look around at what's available in your area is is the best way. And setting up the the, the tours, like you suggested, and you can sure. get a feel for for who's running the program and what they offer and, and what works for you. So that's a great advice and, and for anybody interested in, in exploring therapeutic writing more. And of course, they can read your book and understand um, stories and, and what's going on there. So I wanted to talk about Little Victories a little bit more here because I'm curious, you did such a great job telling us what, what, what was in the contents and, and I just want was there a feeling or a message that you wanted to, uh, readers to leave this book with that's, that's important? Um, what's, what's the message that you were hoping to deliver with this book? You know, I think my overall goal for Little Victories is to increase awareness of the value of therapeutic writing, but also um, to try to reach different audiences that aren't already familiar with the program. This is the type of book you know, if you're already involved in therapeutic writing, you could give to someone who knows nothing about mm. horses or uh, therapeutic writing, and they will at the end, and they'll have a better understanding of the life that someone who's disabled goes through. Because I also share some of Debbie's um, lecture notes when she's doing public speaking and classroom speaking later to help people understand what it's like to live or even teach writing lessons as someone who's disabled. So in a nutshell, I really wanted to increase awareness of this important area. And that and that's so wonderful. And and a portion of the proceeds actually from the book sales go to therapeutic writing programs. Can you tell us a little bit about your decision? Obviously you're a huge supporter of therapeutic writing, so this makes a lot of sense. But um, can you tell us a little bit about your decision to, to donate a portion of the proceeds to these programs? Sure. When I first um, decided to publish this book, I was my the book I had published before this um, about the Cleveland Grand Prix was published traditionally through the History Press, Arcadia. And I went through that process. It was very good. But then when I was putting Little Victories together, I thought it would be nice if I could give back and a portion of the proceeds be able to, um, that I bring in, I'm writing a check and donating back. And I decided to go independent publishing and set up Brown Dog Books for that purpose because I could control that a little bit better and a portion. Um, if you are doing the publishing um, through KDP Publishing or, or another group, you sort of have removed the middleman a little bit and the profits are such that you can control what you're able to share and, and keep the costs down, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided to publish this book independently so that I could be able to have a little bit more of the proceeds. And contrary to what people think, publishing a book is not going to make a lot of money, <laughs> but there's, if each book that's sold, I can tell myself I'm going to be able to take a little bit of each to get back. That's what I wanted to happen. That's really beautiful. And um, I commend you for, for doing that and giving, giving back to the community that you, you care so deeply about. Well, I also was able to, in doing it independently, offer it as a, um, a bulk uh, discount. So if a, a say a 4-H group wants to do a fundraiser or somebody for educational or therapeutic purposes wants to buy the books in bulk, uh, they can get it at a much lower cost and I can get it to them and then they can sell it at the retail price and be able to get their uh, the proceeds directly for their fundraising. So that was another little element that uh, instead of selling candy bars, you can sell books and promote reading as well. That's, that's right. And fantastic. And you know, and that's the wonderful thing about independent publishing is that you, you can, you have the power to, to do these things and, and give back um, by just having the, the complete view and the complete control over, over your, your book and the process and the proceeds or in the income. So you, you've written another book, and I'd like to talk about that one a little bit, too, because this is the Equestrian Author Spotlight, so we want to make sure to get both your books in there. And this was fascinating to me as well. So... 
Can you talk a little bit about the history of Grand Prix and what inspired you to write the Cleveland Grand Prix, an American show jumping first? I know it's important to you that people don't forget that the, the American Grand Prix competition started in Ohio, which is something I did not know. So talk to us a little bit about that book. You know, it's one of those things, Carly, and, and other authors know, you, you write about what you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the book, The Cleveland Grand Prix, is something that was near and dear to my heart because I'd been a volunteer and uh, worked on the horse show for many, many years and uh, also did publicity. I chaired the Chagrin Valley Hunter Jumper Classic for many years. And so I knew the history. I'd worked over the years in the show jumping world. Part of my publicist role, one of my jobs at one point was uh, being head of public relations for the American Grand Prix Association. So I went around the country, dream job, uh, to sure. every Grand Prix in the country, um, introducing the sport to journalists. And I would get these sports writers who knew nothing about show jumping, who got the assignment and they thought they drew the short straw. And I'd take them on course walks and let them see the jumps and meet the riders and try to get them excited about it. So that's a little of my Grand Prix background. And I worked for people like Gene Mish on the Winter Equestrian Festival. So I was very close to the sport. And in my backyard is the, the, Metro Park's polo field, which was home to the very first show jumping Grand Prix in North America. And it was in the year 1965, and it was hosted here. And over the years being publicist, you accumulate a lot of stuff. And I had boxes and boxes, and when people passed away, they seemed to send me all their old horse show stuff from this one horse show. And I had all the archives, and um, the, the truth is, I had in the back of my mind thought I should document this at some point, and it wasn't until I broke my foot in a horse-related accident and had a couple of surgeries oh, that no. I had nothing else to do, so I started on the book. And uh, I learned a lot about, I was going to chronicle each year of the Grand Prix, and then I asked myself, well, why Cleveland? Why on earth would you think the first Grand Prix would have been in Kentucky or Florida or Texas? But at the time, Cleveland was this incredible world-class equestrian hub. Mm -hmm. And back in the industrial age, Cleveland was the home to many millionaires, the Rockefellers and uh, uh, the Humphreys and many other uh, families lived here. And so with that came their passion for horses. So we had international polo in Cleveland. We had uh, a racetrack and we had horse racing going on from, you know, people came in from around the world. And so show jumping was another way for the wealthy to show off what they, uh, uh, their, their wealth and their passion of horses. Um, an individual named Laddie and a hazy and another individual named Jerry Baker had seen what was happening in Europe and had been mm -hmm. over there and uh, knew that Grand Prix show jumping was very big in Europe and in Aachen, Germany was the creme de la creme. And they saw that our riders were not keeping up with the international Olympic riders. So they decided they needed to create a Grand Prix here in this country and get it. We had show jumping in America, mm -hmm. but at that time they were, if you saw the old movies of Snowman with the stick jumps, the, mm -hmm. the real bear and they were a lot of indoors the, that was the show jumping before it came to the grand prix and the grand prix show jumping was outdoors on these giant courses with very natural obstacles and so they they came up with the first sponsor who put up the three thousand dollar purse and <laughs> boy have we come a long way with oh two million dollar purses but uh, they started it right here in cleveland and Cleveland is still incredibly proud. That horse show at the Cleveland Metro Parks Polo Field still goes on today. The, it's under the name Chagrin Hunter Jumper Classic, and they still host the Cleveland Grand Prix, which was the very first. And in its day, the horse show would have audiences of 50,000 people. And there weren't Grand Prix anywhere else. Mm. And 
um, Olympic teams were decided here in Cleveland. And there's a bronze historic marker that on the polo field today that shows the site of that first Grand Prix. And I think as people go on and people pass away, history is lost. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to and I have a lot of interviews in that book and research from some of the old horsemen, Bill Steinkraus and Gene Misch and, and uh, Howard Lewis and others who shared with me a lot of that history and uh, as well as Laddie and Hazy and, uh, uh, and so that book kind of chronicles so people don't forget the roots of show jumping and they don't forget Cleveland as we grow to this incredible industry of show jumping in America now, I don't want them to forget their roots. That is fascinating and fantastic. And how much fun was that probably to write, sitting down and talking with these people and, and archiving something that was such a rich part of horse history in the United States. Like, that must have been so fun. It, it really was. Uh, I will say fun is a, you know, <laughs> writing, writing. <laughs> writing, non, writing nonfiction is you know, my background is a newspaper journalist, so I know nonfiction and I have such admiration for writers who can write fiction. I wish I had that creative talent, but my background's really nonfiction. So it's, uh, it is fun, but the research is so extensive and the interviews and, and knowing when to let go and mm. let it fly. So it's tough. Well, and, and, but thank you. Thank you for recording this history and making sure that that's preserved. And, you know, we, we need nonfiction authors in order for that to happen. So thank you for preserving this piece of equestrian history for us. And I'm also excited to read this book too, because you, you sent that one to me as well. So I'm like, I'm fascinated. I can't wait to dig in and, and read them. Well, speaking of history, I was so proud because the Cleveland Grand Prix book uh, was part of an exhibit in Kentucky at the Kentucky Horse Park at the Wheeler Museum, which is in the United States Hunter Jumper Association offices. And it became part of an exhibit on the history of show jumping. And I understand that they're going to be doing a similar exhibit that the Cleveland Grand Prix will be uh, featured in. Well, you know, you mentioned this dream job. And what, what was so fascinating to me as I was researching you and your books, um, you, you have such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to communication and uh, horse issues and you know, horse history. I was reading in an article um, in Sidelines Magazine that in the mid 1980s, ESPN had committed to broadcasting several of the Grand Prix. Uh, and you help the commentators prepare, which, you, which you've mentioned, you help the, the journalists prepare. But at one point there was something that happened and you wound up being a commentator? <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about this and how fun is that? Well, you know, you're right. It really is interesting when you start this career path, things, opportunities present themselves. And this was just that situation. I never set out to do anything with television. However, we were at a Grand Prix in Vermont, I think. And the uh, the producer came and said, you know, we have a problem. Our commentator missed their flight and it was uh, getting ready to uh, uh, prepare for a broadcast. ESPN at that time was broadcasting a number of different Grand Prix around the country that were part of the Grand Prix series. And they said, you know, you're always, you're the one who gives us the questions to ask and the background and all the information. Will you fill in? And I like to be behind the scenes. I mean, I like the role of promoting others, not being up front. It's not quite as comfortable with that. I can fake it, but the truth is. Uh, so there was really nothing else. And I said, you know what? Sure, I'll do it. And I think that is what's happened to me along my career path. People, opportunities come up and you just have to say, okay, because you don't want to wonder what if. So I said yes that day. And it was okay. I did all right. And uh, they seemed happy. And they asked me if I would come back and do some other broadcasts. And then I did a few for PBS. And uh, there's some old clips around. Uh, I think there's one on my website from uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, it was really fun. It was an interesting, interesting experience. And I think that's what 
I'm so lucky is that I can combine my equestrian and my communications. And I want to, no matter how old you get or what you've done, you want to keep learning oh. and doing new things. Absolutely. And, and that's how I ended up starting to write books because I hadn't done a book. Mm -hmm. I had done many other types of writing all my life, but you, you look around and you think, I never did that. I never did a podcast until today, Carly. <laughs> See, <laughs> I'm learning still. <laughs> I get to be one of your first. I love that. You well, you're, you're, you're kicking high knee on this, this podcast. You're doing a great job. <laughs> it's that communications polish. I like it. You make it easy, Carly. I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, well, well, how I like it to be is just two friends chatting about the best things on earth, horses and books, and, and you're making it easy too. I'm really enjoying this conversation. Conversation. I just, I just can't get over. I, I feel like um, the opportunities that have presented themselves for you that you've embraced and taken on, like doing color commentary for the Grand Prix on TV, is so cool. And I, fe I feel like I love that you embrace those and you, and you took it on and have continued to grow and learn, no matter what age you are. I, I feel exactly the same way, and I feel so blessed. I think as authors or as writers or as communications professionals, I also have a a background in corporate public relations. You know, I think it, it really does open up a whole lot of really great opportunities that are sometimes very scary, but, but saying yes to those moments, I feel like there's really an opportunity to grow. So thank you for expanding on that and how neat, you know, I hope we can maybe dig up one of those old real clips to include in your show notes. So <laughs> if, if you're comfortable. So if you're looking, I think it's on my website, uh, as I recall. I don't think when I switched over to add the Little Victories book, it used to just be the Cleveland Grand Prix, mm -hmm. and the, the books before that were all ghost written, so uh, they never earned their way to a website because they were written for someone else. But mm -hmm. this one, these two are under my name, so I decided I had to have a website for them, and I think that old clip is on there, is under by author something or whatever. I'll have to, I'll link to that. if, if <laughs> I think it's really exciting. Um, so, so, you, so you mentioned that you self-published Little Victories, so you, you could donate the proceeds to uh, therapeutic writing organizations, but you, you traditionally published with, with the first book about the Grand Prix. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, with traditional publishing and you know, any advice that you might have for authors that are, are looking at both options and, and you know, maybe the pros and cons of both, uh, if you could share? You know, my first book about the Cleveland Grand Prix was written um, with such detail and documentation, footnotes, and, and, and uh, I researched it through history centers and libraries, so you have to use a lot of documentation. And it really lent itself well to traditional publishing with a history or an academic publisher. Mm -hmm. And the history press, which is now Arcadia, um, really was interested in the book because it was a regional theme, but because I also had the equestrian connections. So again, my publishing is a learning experience. So I had an editor, I had a publishing team. It was a really good experience for me to learn and go through all that, the process of their creating a cover and their laying out the book. And they took care of so many things, I didn't have to make decisions. And I, mm -hmm. I learned from that. Um, there were things that you know, as a professional journalist and public relations person, and I, my full-time work is having my own public relations agency. So I know that end of the business. And that's where traditional publishers are a little weaker and why a lot of authors seek their own publicists because they can only do so much for you to promote your book. And they look for authors to have their own platform and social media and their own connections and their own following. Mm -hmm. So um, that's very helpful. But even beyond what they did, I did so much more of my own. Um, they might have gotten one book talk for me at a history center. Oh, I'll tell you one thing. They did book a uh, talk for me. And no negatives, no complaints whatsoever, but they just, no one can know your audience as well as you do as an author. I agree. So they, they booked a book talk for me at a Barnes and Noble in um, 
an area of Cleveland where there's a lot of universities and it's wonderful. And I was so excited because I'd had other book talks and it gotten great turnout and I was excited. And I went to this book talk and I thought it was an, I'm like, wow, all these universities, you know, obviously they're publicists, they must know what they're doing. And I set up and waited and waited and finally one man came in and he bought the book and brought it to me to sign and he goes oh i'm such a fan of the grand prix and he started talking about it and i realized in his talking uh there was a problem and i said sir i'm really happy you bought the book but let me just ask you do you think that the cleveland grand prix i'm writing about is the car race cleveland grand prix and he said, yes, I love the Cleveland Grand Prix car race. And I said, oh, yes, I, I understand. But I have to tell you, my book is about the Cleveland Grand Prix, the horse show jumping uh, event. It's very <laughs> different. It's not a car race. And there are two Cleveland Grand Prix. And he was so kind. He said, oh, he goes, yeah, that's not what I thought this was. I said, well, if you want, I'm happy to give you your money back. It was my one big sale. And he said, no, I, I can find somebody I could give it to. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> Talk about it. Talk about a good uh, uh, wake up call. But um, so that's the issue with the traditional publishing is knowing your audience. And, and mm -hmm. I still am thrilled with the job that they did on the book. It's beautiful. And, and they continue to distribute and got it into places that I, I wouldn't have. But that was a good learning experience, the pros and cons. Going traditional, I knew that I knew my audience. I knew the therapeutic writing centers. I knew the organizations. I knew um, uh, how I thought the book should be publicized. Mm -hmm. And I did explore looking at an agent for it because I wanted this book to go not through my equestrian connections, but I originally wanted the book to go to a place like Scholastic mm. because I wanted it to be something that would get out to schools and libraries so that young people would learn about what it's like to be disabled and the horse world. And I do detail in the book like cleaning stalls and, you know, things for people who are horse lovers but don't know anything about horses. So um, that that was originally what I wanted to do with the book. And I had um, thought I would go that route, but it was a hybrid of a book because it's a horse story, it's inspirational, and it talks about a different world. So it didn't fit into the niche for a lot of publishers. I had a lot of agents and publishers who read the manuscript, really liked it, mm -hmm. really thought it was compelling, but it wasn't quite the right fit for what they needed. So I wasn't about to let the book go. And I did, that's when I had learned from some other authors that independent publishing nowadays is very different from what it used to be. It mm -hmm. used to have a stigma of being a vanity press. Mm -hmm. And so I really started learning about, and, and again, another chapter for me to learn about independent publishing. Um, the thing I would say is that I... I knew I could deliver in helping the publicity, and I called on an old friend of mine who has a equestrian uh, PR firm to help market the book for me as well, because you don't want to be too close to your own book and do it all yourself. And that would be the advice I would have, is that just because you're publishing yourself doesn't mean that the book deserves any less of a professional team. So I stepped back and I said, okay, I can't be so close to this. It's like we can't edit our own work and expect right. it's going to be. So I went about and hired the best team I could. And I started early on the book. Um, I had a children's librarian review the book. And this woman was amazing. She felt it was a middle grade to young adult title. And um, I'd never written for that audience. So I kind of took a approach. She really liked it and thought it was a good fit for that audience. And um, I trusted her and I still admire her so much. She was college roommates with Laura Hillenbrand, who wrote Seabiscuit. So I thought, <laughs> okay, if Laura could use her to write or read some of her early stuff, can I get you to, and she was very kind here in Ohio and did the same for me. Uh -huh. And um, after that, I set about getting some additional help in editing. Um, I had a wonderful 
person do some early editing for me who works with a university press. My final editor I hired was uh, a name in equestrian journalists and editing people will know Nancy Jaffer, who's written her own horse books mm -hmm. and was a longtime editor with the Star Ledger in New Jersey. And I was afraid for her to read it. And <laughs> Uh, because I knew Nancy for many years. I thought, oh, no, she's going to take my book and make it into a short story after she chops it all up. And she was so wonderful and just tightened it and helped make it a little bit more concise. Mm -hmm. um, I hired a design team early on, and it was a woman who had published her own book through Amazon, which is Kindle uh, uh, Publishing. And KDP, sorry, is the name of their publishing arm. And she and her husband have a design shop, You're a Creative, and they were able to work with me to um, take my ideas, and they read the book and understood what I wanted. So they created the cover, and they helped so that the cover would tell the story, and then they did the whole layout and helped with the, the actual uploading and dealing with it because as you saw at the beginning, Carly, I am not a techie person and I did not want to botch this. And after you spend three years writing a book, you, you owe it to that project. Now, of course, you have to invest a bit into it, mm -hmm. but hopefully I'll recoup some of that. But it was really important to me that I had a professional team that would work for a publisher as if you know I were going through a publisher. So I would say, any author needs to understand they're not an island. You need to be part of a team and get the best you can. And maybe it's through a local college or maybe you aren't going to hire, you know, the people I did, but you can find extra help out there that, you know, it might be a teacher or a librarian who can help you and give you some uh, independent advice and, and perspective so you can make sure your readers are all going to understand what you wrote. Our insider terminology in the horse world can be a problem sometimes. <laughs> That's true. And uh, I, th I think you really spoke very articulately about the power that comes with independent publishing is, you know, you have a lot of creative control, you own your, your product, you own your intellectual property, but you also have a responsibility to making sure that you uh, release the very best product you can. And that often does require a team of others um, to help you along the way, which I do. I, I have an editor, I have a copy editor, I have a cover designer, I have formatters, you know, and, and it does sound like a lot of work and it does sound like it's very expensive, but there are people that are dreamers that are just coming up the ranks and want to build their resume that will lend a hand. My actually my audiobook narrator, I, I met her in, in a former corporate job and her dream was to always be a narrator and she narrated some commercials for my company and I heard her voice and I said she would be absolutely perfect for my audiobook. So I started this partnership with her and I was like, look, I don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what you're doing, but you kind of have the basics of the technology. Why don't we try this together? And we started out this beautiful partnership where we we're both supporting each other, each other's dreams. And, and she is so good. So now we just finished recording the third book together and she's building her resume and I have connected other horse book authors to her. So she's getting more work and more, um, projects. And it's just, it's, it's like beautiful, you know, it's like we can all, you know, support each other. What a wonderful thing that you were able to give somebody a wonderful credential too and a leg up who's getting started. And that's, you know, I've always worked with interns and, and done mentoring because that's a wonderful thing if you can do that. There's such great talent out there. And our equestrian community, while it's broad in many disciplines and many breeds and many, many aspects to it, it is our own little community and we really have to help each other out. And I always answer every email and talk to people and, you know, do what you can because somebody helped me along the way. Mm -hmm. And if you can help somebody else, you know, we owe it to each other to stick together. I couldn't agree more. And I love, I love hearing that others feel the same way. So thank you for being part of a very supportive community of authors, authors supporting authors. Um, so thank you for all that information. And then, you know, I was curious uh, if you had any advice. I mean, you have a wealth of expertise. You've been in the equestrian industry for a very long time. You're a communications professional. You've now written your own books. You've 
run commentary on TV. <laughs> You've done all sorts of fantastic things with it. You have your own PR agency. What would you, what would be advice for you that you would share with authors that are aspiring to write their own books and just haven't tried it yet? Like what, what would you say for people that are, are thinking big and dreaming big? You know, it's daunting to think I'm going to write a book mm -hmm. and so many things start small. And I think that the other non-equestrian authors I know, um, some of them, a, a good friend of mine wrote a wonderful book on um, victims of human trafficking. And he started as an article and it was an article in Christian Science Monitor. And that grew into a book. So, you know, the old adage, baby steps. I think if you can start small, and it might just be a short story, it might be a little article for your local newspaper about something. Um, it might be, uh, you, know, you, you start small and you grow from there. And any book, if you think I'm gonna sit down and start at the beginning and write to here, well, it just isn't going to get done. It's um, like that jigsaw puzzle again, putting all the pieces together. And, you know, you may have one story, you may start at the end and it may fit into your entire bigger picture later. Um, and in nonfiction, we tend to do outlines and, and work that way and kind of see how it's going to go. But you don't necessarily write from beginning to end. You put the pieces together, as I said. And I think that would be my my advice would be that you need to um, not be so intimidated by the process of where do I begin your wheels spin like I don't even know where to begin right you know begin anywhere it might just be taking notes it might be a paragraph I use my uh, my phone and if as I'm driving and use the um, voice to text feature to email myself paragraphs of ideas and <laughs> observations and you, then you put it all together but uh, uh, but I think that's uh, that's a big part of it is a, a good place to start that and having a routine and a discipline for writing mm -hmm. that's that's great advice if you if you think of the whole the whole book you know it, it is very daunting and it can totally deter any progress so just little baby steps I love that advice uh, so, you know, I wanted to also ask you, this is a great lead in. I mean, given your professional background and experience, um, you know, what do you wish you had known, known when you started out on the adventure of, of writing a nonfiction book? Hmm. You know, I think most of us as authors are used to being solo and to working alone and needing your quiet time, which is wonderful. But just recently, in the last year or two, I started becoming more aware of this writing community, whether it's the one you've kind of created with what you're doing, or um, in my community in the Cleveland area, there are so many organizations that are from the libraries to um, the, there's a group called Literary Cleveland that are pulling writers together and having um, free seminars and get-togethers and independent panels. And I started learning about book festivals and uh, attended my first one a few years ago. So I really never noticed um, all, I don't know if it's always been there or I just noticed. I think it's just grown that much. Um, but whether you know you, your book gets published for the world to read or it's you know, I once did a cookbook just for my family uh, to share my mom's recipes after she, you know, it can be something that personal. It doesn't matter. I, a friend of mine told me if only one person reads my book, I will consider myself, you know, successful. And, and it's all our own personal success. But when you start connecting with other writers in this writing community, um, you start learning you start realizing, you know, getting great ideas for techniques and, and you can make such great progress learning from that. And uh, I think that would be the one thing I, you know, until, like I said, the last couple of years, and I've been around a lot longer than that, um, I didn't realize that there were so many resources for writers and organizations out there. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that's, that's so true. I think as writers, we can 
we tend to be maybe a little introverted. I know, you know, I, I seem like very extroverted, but I'm actually kind of a, an introvert at heart. And I like to, you know, hunker down and, and do my thing and, uh, you know, and write. And it's important to poke your head out every now and then and, and go to conferences. And, you know, there's the American Horse Publications, which is a huge organization that supports uh, professionals in equine media. So books are a part of that. And they have an annual conference every year, which is great for networking and making connections. There's local, you know, chapters of, for me, you know, the Romance Writers of America. There is mm -hmm. uh, the Equus Film Festival that's coming up at the Kentucky Horse Park, an excellent opportunity to to network. And I think what I notice when, when I get involved in these things and I pop my head out and I come out from behind the computer uh, that I'm inspired. Like I get very, I'm very inspired uh, talking to fellow authors and, and people in our community. And I'm very inspired doing this podcast, actually. I mean, this, I'm inspired right now listening to um, you talk about your books and, and what you've been up to. And it's, it's just, there's such a wealth of information and support available. And I, and I, I love to hear that um, you notice that and you're an advocate for it. So it's great. I'm glad you mentioned American Horse Publications because I joined that a few years ago when I put the first book out and they do book awards. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, I never thought of awards or doing things for that purpose, but, you know, it's, it's a chance to go whether you win or not. And you get together with your peers and, and you're inspired and mm -hmm. it is inspirational. And there's, a number of, regardless of your genre, there's a group for you out there. And whether it's equestrian or not, you're going to learn from what they're doing. Absolutely. And that's great. That's great advice. So uh, do you, this is, uh, I'm always intrigued to hear uh, if people have any writing rituals or routines. Is there anything that you do to get you in the mood to put words on, on the page? Wow. So I am a morning person. Okay. And I start every day in the barn because you can't do anything till the horses are fed. Horses uh, and the dogs. Come, they always and, come first. The horses <laughs> always, and the dogs always come first. Yep. The I horses and dogs. And then I'm wide awake at five in the morning. No problem. No alarm. I'm going. So that's my best time of the day. Mm. So that's when I sit down. Before I go to the office at eight or nine, I put in a few hours every morning. On, it might be research, it might be reading um, towards whatever project it doesn't. I know authors who say I have to write five pages a day. I don't do that, but I have to do something to towards my current writing project. Mm -hmm. So that ritual, my morning time is probably a good one. I also have little things like horse people. We all are superstitious and we have little things. You know, I have my um, little earrings that are in the quotation marks and I have, my daughter gave me a little pen um, that's a pin that I always have sitting there and it reminds me of her. And, you know, there's little things like that, that kind of uh, keep you, you know, connected while you're solo, you know, closed <laughs> away, trying to force yourself to work. But um, I, I try to have that, that ritual, if you will, of my morning time of giving it. Um, if it doesn't work, I'll fit it. I'll, I'll try anytime. I might be sitting in an airport and get a couple of hours in on mm -hmm. a flight of really good quality work. So you can't say I'll only write in the morning. It's when you're inspired. And if you get a second win in the evening and you get going, just when it, when you feel it, in here, that's when you know it's time, you know, stop what you're doing, find time. Now, again, if you're working, you know, that's another story, but I find a way to keep notes and go back to it, write everything down. Absolutely. Uh, when then, when that spark shows up, you got to capture it because I like, I can't tell you how many times I've woken my husband up in the middle of the night because I pop up and I've had a thought and I have to scribble it down really quick. Or I, you know, I have notes all over my car and I'm on my phone capturing things. I always carry a journal. So that, that's great advice too. Like when, when the moment strikes and you feel that inspiration, make sure you grab it because it, it goes away if you don't. Do you keep a, a pad at your bedside uh, I, with a pen when you wake up in the night with that idea or first, yeah, you can't I lose sure it. I sure do. I sure do. I've written entire chapters of my books, like sitting on the, you know, bathroom floor rug, writing in my journal with my cell phone flashlight on so I don't wake up my husband. <laughs> 
<laughs> yep. We, we're so lucky you have supportive family members around you because it is hard. You know, it's a different, it's a different animal being a writer and you got to grab it where you can. And my husband's read so many things for me. The poor man, when he read Little Victories, and he's an attorney, so he's used to marking everything up. Uh, Nothing is without fault. And uh, when he read Little Victories, I was waiting for the, for it. And he said, you know, I liked it. I'm like, what? You're kidding me. <laughs> like, what's wrong? Because I made him proofread uh, the final draft of Cleveland Grand Prix. The printer needed it to go to press. And we were on a train going through Germany and he missed all of Germany because he had to read it for me then. I'm like, you have to help me here. I need fresh eyes. <laughs> so it's very fortunate when you have uh, family members or friends who support the initiative, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Here, here's to our literary husbands that put up with all the crazy that comes with being with an author. <laughs> you bet. And it's fun too. It's all. It, I, my husband always says, says uh, you know, I'm just a banker. People, you give me something to talk about. Like I can talk about my wife, who's the author. You know, my life is kind of boring. And I was like, oh, you know, thank you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, we're getting towards the end of the interview, and I've so enjoyed our time together. I am wondering. What are you curious about now? What, what, what are you interested in taking on so you stay young and keep the brain Ooh, working? That's a good one. I have a couple things floating around and I have to devote myself to helping little victories get the attention it deserves. But, you know, I have um, an idea for a children's series, of course, horse, which I haven't done yet. I'd love to, I don't know how, maybe, uh, Equus uh, Film Festival will help connect me and get me ideas. I'd love to see Little Victories make its way to the screen because I think it's one of those inspirational stories that would reach out is an after school special for Disney or a Hallmark or something, I don't know. But I'd love to see it find its way to the screen because it's a special story. But uh, And that world hasn't been. When you look at what's out there with books and for for young adults and you look at you know, true stories. It's somebody who got bit by a shark. There, you know, there aren't a lot of true life stories uh, uh, that uh, appeal to young people. And I'd like to think that the combination of horses in this unique world might. So I think it'll be something new I haven't done, that's for sure. But mm -hmm. I can't say which yet. Well, I think those are both great ideas and great things to aspire towards. Uh, the Equus Film Festival is certainly a great space for you to ha open that dialogue about little victories. And then Ray Rakin, who is a children's first book author, just did a podcast with me too. And she shares so much information on how to write a children's first book that that one might be valuable for you too. Your podcasts are amazing. I went through and listened to them all before this one. And that's how I first learned of the Equus Festival. So oh. I am so grateful for what you're doing and keep doing it because it's, you know, it's, you continue to reach more and more. It's like throwing that pebble out into the water and the rings keep going farther and farther. And I'll be sharing all this to my Hunter Jumper World audiences and my other ones here. And I just, um, I appreciate what you're doing. Oh, that, thank you. That is fantastic feedback. And you know, I, this podcast wouldn't be anything without the fantastic guests that are willing to come on the show and talk with me. So thank you for being part of that. <laughs> Thanks for uh, having me. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, I, I just really appreciate your time and all the information. And I'm so excited to have you on the show. And I wish you the best of luck with your books. Can you let listeners know where they can follow you and find your books? Well, thank you. I will. Um, the books are uh, on Amazon, but they're also available if you're in Ohio in local bookstores and tax shops around the state. Uh, my website, bettyweibel.com, and I'll spell it because my name can be B-E-T-T-Y-W-E-I-B-E-L.com, uh, has a list of some of the retailers there and links to uh, the book pages. And if you read it and like it, please share your reviews. If you don't like it, that's, I respect that. Don't share your views. Uh, <laughs> we don't need to know about that, <laughs> but, uh, only, but I only do positivity here, right? Just only me personally, not publicly, <laughs> but, uh, but those are good places. I'm on Facebook. Cleveland Grand Prix has its own Facebook page and Betty Weibel has a Facebook page as well and, uh, LinkedIn as well. So, um, I invite you to join me and I'll keep expanding my platforms. Thanks to you and uh, get in there on YouTube as well. 
Great. And I will make sure to link to all the places where people can find you and your books in the episode show notes. And Betty, you have a lovely rest of your day. Enjoy your time with the manure and the ponies. I will too. <laughs> it's lunchtime over here. So that's, that's what I'm going to be up to next. But it's perfect timing. You. I have to go feed. Thank you so much. Oh, I so enjoyed having you on the show. You have a great day. Thank Bye, you. Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes and make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? Gallop over to carlycadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlycadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle. <laughs>